Um, I don't know how many of you went to the April potpourri at the FAC last week, but um, one thing I noticed about the story project, it's not just about learning about our community here and being a part of it, but you get to learn about other communities, like the gentleman who told about his son or his mom in Mexico. And you get to learn about a lot of other communities and get in, be in touch with them. And my story, a lot of my stories are from Northern Illinois. I grew up in a farm community, and it's approximately 972 miles from here, and um, <laughs> approximately. <laughs> um, but it was the first day, it was the beginning of July, 1976, and it was a blistering hot day, and we were in a drought, and it hadn't rained all summer, but the carnival had just rolled into town, so it had showed up for a four-day four weekend. So everyone in my town knew that it was going to rain within the next four days <laughs> because it always rained when the carnival came to town. <laughs> and when the rains hit the carnival, there were only two places you could go to get refuge. One was the Banshell, and the other one was Rip Off Row. That was in the carnival, the place where you could go win prizes by trying to play those rigged games and you could throw the dart and pop balloons, or you could try to knock over those clunky milk bottles with lopsided balls. And my friends and I spent a lot of time there trying to win rock and roll posters and switchblades and pipes. <laughs> but on the other side of the river, underneath the train bridge on the far west side of town, my friends Donnie, Tommy, and Ace and I were walking down Dodge Street, and it was about a half a mile past where the blacktop ended and the dirt road started. And our parents weren't around as much as they would like to have been, probably, because they worked really hard. And there weren't a lot of police on the West End either, so there was always a spirit of adventure, like anything could happen at any time. <laughs> And this day started out very calm. There was no action at all. But shit was about to hit the fan. <laughs> so we're walking down the road, and we hear someone yelling, guys, guys, hey, guys. And we turned around, and it was Randy Williams. And he was pedaling down that dirt road towards us as fast as he could on a brand new lime green metallic Schwinn Stingray. <laughs> and at first we thought he was gonna run us over, but at the last second he locked up his handbrakes and slid to a stop. And he said, old man Wolf's looking for you, Ace. He said if he finds you, he's gonna make you pay for what you did to Wolfie. Your ass is grass, Ace. <laughs> And as the words rolled off his lips, we could see over Randy's shoulder, Old Man Wolf take the turn off Eels Avenue onto the pavement on Dodge Street. And there was no mistake in Old Man Wolf and his car and the sound of it. He had a 1971 jet black Plymouth Fury with a V8, that's a big block, and it had a police interceptor engine and 480 pounds of torque. And he also had non-functional side air louvers on that car. And we, we, and when we were all waiting for that moment when his wheels would jump off the blacktop and hit that dirt road. And when it happened, plumes of dust shot up from the side of his car and they went straight up into the air and curled around into the shape of evil devil horns. <laughs> And I don't know what was more dramatic, Old Man Wolf bearing down on us or Randy Williams straddling that sweet stingray. <laughs> he had his arms up in the air like this. And that bike had a, a pogo banana seat, a sweet sissy bar, monkey hangers, and a chromed out pumpkin headlight. We couldn't believe that Old Man Wolf was gonna fight Ace. Now Ace, was my best friend in the whole world, and Ace was 12 years old. <laughs> and Randy, 
Randy wasn't even supposed to be there. Randy wasn't even supposed to be alive. Randy's mom was a former mental patient at the Dixon State School. And when, in 1916, a group of esteemed doctors put together a proposal to build the state school, and this was the largest mental institution, one of the largest in the country, and it was located just on the northeast side of town, just past the city limits. And when they put that plan together in Article 6, they clearly had a vision in mind and they stated that no patients would be allowed to reproduce. There was to be no sex at this facility, period. They wanted to prevent what they called the cycle. And this was... This was basically either an, another abnormal child being brought into the world or a, a normal child being born to a mother who was completely emotionally absent. And a child born into that environment would quickly become feeble-minded itself. And that's not my word, that's just words they used back then. And when they drew up the original plans for this place, they put together a, a plan where there were separate facilities for males and females. There was an A side and a B side. And all of the buildings in this facility were single story red brick cottages. There were no secret hidden stairwells for patients to sneak into to have sex. <laughs> and even the bushes and the landscaping, they were, meticulously trimmed into the shape of really tall wine glasses. <laughs> so patients could not, patients could not sneak away for a secret fit of passion. But despite all these precautions, once Randy's mom proved to the staff that she was capable and fit to live on her own, and she was released and settled into the West End in a house close to the river, Randy was born. And Randy's mom turned out to be totally incapable of raising a child. And she eventually confined herself to the upper level of the house. She never came downstairs and she never interfered in Randy's life. And Randy was born a totally normal child with totally normal West End sensibilities he knew how to work an angle. <laughs> With no one there to tell Randy what to do, Randy did whatever he wanted to, and he did it whenever he wanted to. And apparently, once he got, he convinced his mom to sign over her monthly checks that she got from the state, Randy bought whatever he wanted. <laughs> now, once he had his Stingray collection complete, he moved on to guitars. One month he bought a Fender Stratocaster, the next month it was a Court Flying V, after that he got a Gibson Marauder. And then he moved on to concert tickets. He, he bought tickets to every major concert that came to the area. Ted Nugent, Molly Hatchett, uh, Pat Travers, Peter Frampton. After that he moved on to motorcycles. But Randy was bigger than life to me and he became a legend one day when he pulled in on, his, uh, on another brand new Schwinn Stingray. This was a purple fastback. It had a five-speed stick shift on the crossbars with reverse shift pattern. And I remember I was in the pool hall playing foosball with my friend Ducky. And Ducky was the best foosball player in town and he was showing off his new move, his trademark move called the sodomizer. <laughs> And I, I remember I was in, I, re, I, can, I will never forget that crowd that gathered around Randy in that alley behind the pool hall. And we watched Randy reach into his wallet and pluck out two tickets to see Kiss. And this was the biggest thing that had ever happened to our town. And I couldn't believe it. Kiss, right there in the alley. All the members right there in Randy's wallet. 
Now, Ace, Ace's old man was a vicious drunk. He used to hang Ace from a tree branch six to seven feet off the ground when he was only four years old, just to toughen him up. You'd go to a family barbecue or a poker game, and there'd be Ace hanging from that tree branch, screaming at the top of his lungs. And Ace had two older brothers that were mean as hell. They had ripped off, robbed, double-crossed, and cheated and otherwise vandalized half the town. So Ace used to get his ass kicked on a daily basis just because of his last name. <laughs> Until he started fighting back. I remember once I was with Ace and we were eating burgers at White Castles. And there were the three older kids outside the window tapping on the glass, punching their fists into their palms trying to get Ace to come outside so they could kick his butt. And we took our time finishing our food because we were hoping that they would leave. <laughs> but they didn't, so we finished our burgers and then we went outside and I watched Ace open up a can of whoop-ass on three guys at once. <laughs> but it, it, with each one of these confrontations that could only be solved by violence, it took its toll on Ace, and it was sad. Every time he got in a fight, he built up this wall a little bit higher for protection. And after each fight, he would go behind that wall, and you could not reach him. He would just stare out. And even if you shook him by the shoulders, he just would not respond. He just had this blank look on his face. And every question I gave Ace at that time was an impossible question for Ace to answer. What do you want to do next? Where do you want to go? And where do, what do I want to do next? What can I do? Where do I want to go? Where can I go to escape this fucking town and all these assholes? <laughs> but there was no escape in Old Man Wolf. Old Man Wolf was now about a quarter mile away, heading down that dirt road towards us. And the, I am not kidding you. This was like right out of a movie. These dust plumes were now 40 or 50 feet in the air and they looked like <laughs> devil horns. And just the heat coming off that road, that fury looked like it was just floating in those wavy patterns. And we could see old man Wolf clenching that steering wheel with a death grip. And his face was just floating above that steering wheel. And at first, we th and, and Ace was calm too calm. He was scouting the ground, looking for a weapon, anything he could use on Old Man Wolf, anything that he could use to fortify that wall and just add another layer to it for protection, a bent piece of rebar, maybe a broken fence post or a chunk of concrete. But we thought Old Man Wolf was actually going to drive past us. He was going so fast, but at the last second, he locked up the brakes on that fury, and that cloud of dust covered the entire field, and he disappeared from view. We couldn't even see him in his fury, but we could hear his door open and slam shut really loud. And when that dust cloud finally drifted past, Old Man Wolf was standing there, staring down Ace. Are you Ace? Are you the one that beat up Wolfie? You gotta be kidding me. This is the little shit that beat you up? We hadn't noticed, but Wolfie was in the front seat of the Fury the whole time. Now, the all-star wrestling craze had swept through our town a couple months prior. <laughs> And it, the, the AWA made a stop at our high school gymnasium. And all the big stars were there. Nick Bockwinkle, Dusty Rhodes, the Yukon Lumberjack, the Samoans, Jimmy the Fly Snooka, Butcher Brannigan, even the Crusher was there. And Ace and I were there in the 10th row and we were watching Bobby the Brain Heenan, self-proclaimed greatest wrestling coach in the world. And we watched him whip that crowd into a frenzy. 
And then we watched Bobby the Brain Heenan distract the refs so that they couldn't really see what was going on behind them, all that double teaming and all the other illegal activity going on behind him. But the best thing that Bobby the Brain Heenan did was he distracted the other wrestlers. And he was really good at hurling insults at the other wrestlers about them, the way they wrestled, and especially their family. <laughs> Wolfie, get out of the car and get over there and kick his ass right now. Once we realized that Ace only had to fight Wolfie, we all relaxed a little bit. <laughs> now, when we were at that wrestling match, Ace and I, we saw Andre the Giant come out and fight Baron Von Rushke. We watched Andre the Giant throw Baron Von Rushke off the top rope and then Andre the Giant did his signature move. It was a size 24 boot right to the kisser. No one could survive that. And Andre the Giant was seven foot five, 525 pounds. And the Baron Von Rushke was six foot three, 281 pounds. Now, by comparison, um, Old Man Wolf was about five foot 10, 175 pounds, and Ace was about 85 pounds and a sturdy four foot eight. <laughs> but like I said, Ace did not have to fight Old Man Wolf. He only had to fight Wolfie. And Wolfie was a gifted wrestler himself. He was a great wrestler at our school, Lincoln School, just like his brothers and his dad before him. Even his mom was a wrestler. <laughs> but when that fight started, when that fight started, we all started screaming at the top of our lungs. And it, we were just like we were back in the gymnasium watch your, watching Nick Bockwinkle defend his title. Come on, Ace, get him, Wolfie. Put him in a sleeper hold. Give him the pendulum. Give him a stand up. You know, the standing clothesline. Give him a Yukon pile driver. But when it started, Ace knew that he couldn't, or Wolfie knew he couldn't, do, he couldn't win back his old man's respect or win the fight against Ace with his fists. So he decided to focus on his ground game and he fed off all that yelling. And so he started throwing every single submission move he could at Ace. And, but Ace, you know, Ace could wriggle free. He was pulling all these great reversals and getting back on his feet. And, and then Old Man Wolf pulled something right out of Bobby the Brain's playbook. And he yelled out, come on, Wolfie, you can kick his ass. That kid's a piece of trash, just like his brother and his mom and his dad. And it worked. Ace got distracted. He looked over at old man Wolf and just glared at him. And, and Wolfie took advantage of that and threw a clean body cover on Ace and got Ace down on the ground and had him pinned really good. And, but Ace was able to get free. Ace got back up on his feet and his shirt was ripped, and his face was red, and his face was, you know, just covered in dirt. And we knew at that point, it was only a matter of seconds before Ace was gonna explode, and things were gonna get really ugly for Wolfie. Hell, I seen Ace take on Fat Albert Clayton once in a walnut fight. <laughs> yeah, now, when, when there's a walnut fight, there are clear rules of engagement. <laughs> Walnuts only, no rocks. Well, Fat Albert Clayton hucked a rock and hit Ace right in the face, and Ace started bleeding. And then Fat Albert Clayton followed up by throwing a tree branch and hit Ace right on the side of the head, and that really pissed Ace off. And I watched Ace 
run across that parking lot or run across the alley between Jackson and Van Buren Avenue and he jumped up on Fat Albert Clayton's back and let loose a barrage of punches around from the back until Fat Albert finally fell over. And when he fell over, Ace jumped on top of Fat Albert and just kept punching him and punching him and punching him until Fat Albert said, I give, I give. So we knew things were going to turn bad for Wolfie any second. But then, old man, the brain wolf, he stepped up his rhetoric and he yelled out, Wolfie, if you don't kick his ass, I'm going to kick your ass like you never had your ass kicked when you get home. And at that moment, I, I, could, I just knew that Ace hated his old man. He hated his old man. He hated this town, and he hated a lot of the people in it. But at that moment, I could tell that Ace hated old man Wolf even more. But then, I will never forget this for the rest of my life. It was one of the most vivid moments. I saw Ace do something I never saw him do in a fight before. He dropped his fists, dropped them down. And it took me a couple years to figure out what was going through Ace's head. I, none of us could really figure it out at that time. But he dropped his fist, and old man Wolf yelled, Come on, Wolfie, hit him! He's wide open! And Wolfie took advantage of it, and he, he punched Ace right in the face. And then he punched him again, and then he just kept punching him. And, and Ace's hands just went lower and lower, and he just kept getting hit in the face. And old man Wolf was yelling, Hit him! Hit him! Hit him again! And then finally, I mean, Ace never threw a punch back, and I just could not figure out what was going on. And then finally, it was just over. The fight was over, and we were just all standing there, and we just could not believe it. And then old man Wolf came over, and he scooped up Wolfie, and he carried him over to that Plymouth Fury. And he loaded him in the car, and then they drove off, and Old Man Wolf peeled out, and rocks and gravel flew everywhere. And then, you know, Ace wouldn't talk. And for the rest of that weekend at the carnival, we rode the Ferris wheel. We rode the zipper. We hung out under the band, cell, band shell and smoked cigarettes. And... Ace never said a word the entire weekend. And we never, never ever talked about that fight ever again. Thanks. <laughs>